considers herself a song stylist. After nearly 50 years in the music business and over 50 albums to her credit, her performing style stands unmatched. The sweet, sultry voice is still distinctive, and her music remains timeless, making her truly legendary. The incomparable Nancy Wilson, today on Personal Diary. Nancy Sue Wilson. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, Chillicothe. 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 Ohio. Ohio. And uh, grew up in Columbus. Mm -hmm. Olden and Lillian. Yes. Mom and Pop. Tell me a little bit about Columbus and growing up there for you. Okay. I was born in Chillicothe, as I said. Uh, my mother, my natural mother is Lillian. My father and mother were divorced when I was about five, so I've had a B has been in my life for 46 years or so. So I have two moms and my father. So I, w I never think in terms of, I have the oldest of six children, although they aren't by the same mother. My brother and I, uh, were, he was 15 months younger than we have four others. And it's been wonderful being their daughter. Um, I knew my grandparents. I used to go down to Whiskey Run, which is outside Chillicothe in the summers. I knew what it was like to enjoy life. I had a great childhood, loved school, went to a one-room school for a while from, oh, the first grade through the eighth grade, remember my school teacher very well. Just had a ball, enjoyed it, enjoyed high school, good student, had a television show when I was 15. Uh, the singing started very naturally when I was, say, three, four years old. It was obvious to people that the child can sing. And I just did it any time anybody said sing. It just music just poured out of my mouth. It was a gift. I've been blessed with it. I try to use it wisely. Well, sometimes you don't, but the bottom line is you try to do the things that make you happy so that you can sing. I like to sing when I'm happy. I don't want to sing to the exclusion of happiness, and singing is not going to make me totally happy. I need the children and the husband and the family and the home. So I go home and enjoy that because I remember growing up how happy I was. I remember my grandparents. I know who I am. I knew a sense of self. So consequently, I, uh, I'm very pleased to have grown up in the Midwest, in Ohio. You mentioned that you started singing about three or four, mm -hmm. and that indeed you had your own television show at, at mm -hmm. 15. You also sang in nightclubs right. at that age. I'm, I'm curious, as you look back at it now, did you, in fact, pull that off? I mean, you know, that's a certain crowd, and to be 15 and, and pull it off must have been something. I must have pulled it off. <laughs> I worked every weekend that they sent. And I could work many, many different rooms. I was the girl singer in town and in that area of the country. Uh, the musicians would come in from New York and whatnot, Chicago, come through, and everybody knew that there was this young girl in Ohio who sang. I must have been doing something right. And having the television show gave me the exposure in the hometown. Then, working the clubs, um, every major function that was had at, at Valleydale, all the cabarets, I was singing at them. So, I never really stopped and thought about it. I was just doing it and I was enjoying it. I loved the music. I was singing great material. At 15, 16, to be singing, happiness is just a thing called Joe, come rain or come shine, all the great standards. I could sing Cole Porter and George Gershwin. And it was a wonderful, wonderful, and the musicians who were there and played for me, cared about me. They protected me. They saw to it that no one harassed me. Um, it was a great way to learn my craft. You go uh, outside of uh, Ohio and start to travel around, but I guess 1959 can be looked at as mm -hmm. the year that really is a springboard right. for you. Cannonball Adderley right. enters the picture. I had met Cannonball when he first came. I was working with Rusty Bryant's band, and they came to New York to record. I was just working with the band. I, didn't want, I wasn't ready to record yet. I still hadn't quite formed me yet. And um, we became friends, and I, we would correspond, or I'd talk to his family, and I knew Nat, him, and Nat's wife. We were friends. Consequently, um, he had always said, I knew he was with John Levy. John Levy had an assistant who also knew I existed, 
And we'd always decided that when you're ready, you know, when you decide you want to do this, then they would see to it that John Levy got a chance to really hear me. So I just needed a, a place to, to perform so that John could come hear me. And I needed to do that in New York. Finally decided, okay, I'm going to take this six months. I want John Levy, I want Capitol Records, and I want MCA. It took about five weeks, <laughs> and, you know, and it all happened. It's yeah. strange to hear, though, because at such a young age, you said, I'm going to give myself six months in New York. I make it, I make it. If I don't, I suspect you would have said, well, we go it on was to okay. the next phase. It was all, first of all, I was working. I had a uh, lot of work in Ohio. I was doing fine, but it was time to get out of that and go nationally if you're going to do this. Now I'm talking records now. I need to really have the kind of person pr producing that I that can live with me and I can live with the kind of music I want. So that meant David Cavanaugh, who was with Capitol, and John Levy already had um, George Shearing on Capitol. So I had an entree there. So you look around, John Levy was also a manager who cared about the artist, about the person, had one of the greatest reputations of any manager in the business. I wanted to be with the best and somebody who cared. So when I went to New York, um, I went and sat in a few places. Um, I, the, the girl that I was rooming with, she was also a singer. She'd been with Johnny Hammond Smith. So consequently, pe and people knew the name. So I went and sat in at a club in, uh, in the Bronx, on Boston Post Road, the Blue Morocco. And Irene Reed was the uh, singer there, house singer there. She broke her leg within two weeks after I arrived in New York. They called me to replace her, <laughs> so I had a showcase for John Levy to come hear me. I called Julian, I talked Cannonball, and said, okay, tell John, this weekend I'm at the Blue Morocco. John Levy came up, um, the usual, okay, I'll call you. He called me the next day. Within three, four days, we were in the studio with Ray Bryant's trio doing demos. Capitol had them within a week, and the phone call came, don't let anybody else hear them, and everything was really... It was well thought out, I think, because you, you know, as I said, the, the musicians around me, the people cared, and they really, um, it was just kind of all fit in place. It was just that one little cog that wasn't there, and with the job in New York, so John could hear me. I worked during the daytime, first a real serious job I had in the daytime, because I really didn't want to have to depend on any, I mean, things would, I wanted to make sure things were fine, so I worked at the New York Institute of Technology in the daytime, sang four nights a week in the Bronx, had my time free to have my pictures done in the portfolio and do all the things I needed to do and still stayed at this day job while I was recording in California. They, they were wonderful. So there were all kinds of nice people in my life who made things comfortable and easy for me. Indeed, the marriage with Capitol Records comes about. Uh, do you remember when they released, and I'm not going to tell the, the title yet, but when they released the first single? Did you remember the first time you heard it on the radio? Not really. I tell you, the first album, it's because I really didn't go in and record singles. I went in and did albums. I thought the first single was My Foolish Heart. Someone else has told me it was Tell Me the Truth. I think it's My Foolish Heart, <laughs> but I'm not positive. I went away, actually. John Levy is very bright. We wanted to create a demand. When the albums first came out, I was not in the country. Consequently, when I did come back here to work, there was a lot of work, and I, it was just snowballed after that. I was in Australia for three months while the momentum built here in the country. Um, I remember hearing myself on the air, but they were playing. I remember the first time I heard Guess Who I Saw Today on the air. I also remember hearing it on WCFL out of Chicago with Sid McCoy introducing it. Now, that is, oh, I got off work and got in my car one night, and, and this man was saying all these marvelous things in this great voice about sweet Nancy, the baby, and it was enough to, whew, it, it was a great feeling, I'll tell you that. What about the people that you look to for inspiration? Mm -hmm. Who did you listen to and say, perhaps, when you close the door in the evening, boy, mm -hmm. that's who I want to be like, not necessarily emulate, even before I thought about that, I think the sound that I had, the phrasing, uh, came from around eight, ten years old. My father was the one who basically bought records and listened mostly. And uh, it was Lionel Hampton's big band with little Jimmy Scott, the band vocalist, and that's who Nancy Wilson sounds like. The 
being female and coming up around 16 when people heard, I mean, they automatically, they, they want to have you sound like or be like somebody. Then it was uh, Dinah Washington. When uh, Time Magazine gets in the picture, it becomes heir to Ella Fitzgerald. Well, I think if I sounded like anyone, uh, it would have been Dinah Washington, but I actually am as close to Little Jimmy Scott as you can get. That comes from having listened to him for so long. I loved him. I loved Nat Cole, Billy Eckstein. I found the female singers on my own. That was Ruth Brown, Laverne Baker, and Little Miss Cornshucks in Dinah Washington. The jazz came along as I got a little older. Some of the first songs I sang at my high school, like ninth, tenth grade, were by Ella, by Sarah, Sarah Vaughan, more so than Ella Fitzgerald or Billie Holiday. Billie Holiday I found much, much later. So I would say first Little Jimmy Scott, then Dinah Washington, and then Sarah Vaughan. As you look back on your career now, and, and modesty aside, do you see yourself as everyone else does? as a legend do you, do you know that when they talk about singers in history that mm -hmm. your name is going to be on that list i think i finally realized that when when the, uh, regina baker came uh, Regi anita baker and regina bell phyllis hyman then you realize what you mean to other singers i remember the, uh, not being able to really figure out whether i was pleased or upset or the first time i drove up and saw a marquee that said legend nancy wilson i was what four years old you know 39 and all what that then I decided to accept the mantle and wear it and be proud of it and say, yeah, all right. But I want to close the music chapter before we do that. And, and your ideas on music, you, you've been quoted as saying the day music died is the day they brought in 24 tracks. <laughs> you got it. That's the truth. I remember going in the studio with 36 musicians live, downbeat at 8 o'clock, doing four songs, complete and finished. No sweetening because you had an entire arrangement written. You had musicians who could come in and play it. You had sat down with the arranger and your producer long before you ever went in the studio and started spending money. And now, none of that is done until you get in the studio, so consequently, studio time is just outrageously high now. Unbelievable. And, and, and I still like to sing songs as opposed to bits and pieces. Uh, when you could come in and not sing entire songs and, just, and, and piece together a song, you no longer needed to be talented. And there are some, uh, granted there are people who are talented, but you don't have to be anymore. You can make things happen. The artist lost control then, I think. Uh, I still am able to do things the way. And, and I think that there are those coming up today who realize that uh, they want to sing entire pieces of, of you know, creativity comes from the artist also. We need to now go back to where people share that responsibility. Uh, producers should not be able to just produce an artist to extinction. The artist should have input and um, I think that's coming back I want the producers to understand that these people wouldn't you wouldn't want them as your artist if they weren't creative so let their juices flow leave them alone allow them to go in the studio and perform don't overproduce them let them be that's happening more and more now I loved it when we could go in your energy level was just unbelievable because you knew you had to do it now you know if I don't do it today I can do it tomorrow that's not the right attitude to have. I still like going in and knowing I only have a certain amount of time to do this, and that's all I want. I don't want any more time. I, how much, how, you know, it's not going to get better just because you continue to be repetitive. How many ways are there to do anything? I don't want to find every way. I think that I'm going to come in with the correct attitude about it when I walk in the door, and I'll be ready. And anyone who has seen you live knows that they are a very, very important part of you talk of them lovingly uh -huh. and if you sing if I could uh -huh. or heaven's hand you see that the, there's something about children that is very yes. very special to you one of my success really one of the things that I've always wanted to make sure that I, I wanted children I chose to have these children I want my children to be extensions of me I, we talked about self-esteem earlier. Um, there are those of us who have values and a morality and a kind of desire to see this world and this country in particular be a better place to live. Consequently, I wanted children who were caring and who 
are giving. Uh, I'm proud of my children, who is a, a, just a delight. I'm um, with teenage daughters, trying to work with them and keep their outside beauty. You know, I want that inside to come through so you see more than just these pretty young women. Uh, I think they'll be fine. I want them to be caring and concerned. Oh, musically inclined, um, but they're just nice. We have a good time together. I'm, I finally went through a doll period with my girls. You know, I love teddy bears because I've had these girls. They are my reason. Detra, they're, they make it all worthwhile. I, I don't know that I would care as much if I didn't have these children. I care about you because I have these children. I want my children to be out there and be of some kind of service to, to people. So they have been my joy. You know, they are, they're everything to me. Then there's a, a special uh, reverend. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> there's In always been the right reverend. I always used to preface some of the songs I sang about, about that. Um, he's a fine man. He's been there, you know, with me traveling half the time. Um, I'm so pleased that my children, the girls, have always had one of us at home. They have not been without a parent at, at all times. One of us is always there. He, um, he's consistent, you know, he's just there. He's a rock. It's like, uh, it's just nice to, to know that there's this, this person who sits there. And there are sometimes I close my eyes and I just see this uh, Pittsburgh guy, you know, this man who has roots in Virginia who's very much like me. You know, both of us are basically rural people and um, live that way now. And we had some of the same ideas about the fact that I didn't want my children brought up in an inner city if I could allow them to see. I want inner city children to experience a rural way to live. I want it, I, I, I get kind of upset every now and then because we've sold off a lot of our land and I'm, that bothers me. Um, so I went and bought some, I'll keep it for a while. I don't want to sell my 40 acres of the mule. I want to keep them. Before we go, I, I need to, I guess, come back full circle to music and ask you just a couple of more things. And one, obviously, as I've uh, heard and read uh, you say, I can't leave the arena, mm -hmm. the club, the lounge, without doing Guess Who I Saw right. Today. I'm curious, what's your feeling about that song since everyone IDs you with it? When I heard this song, I was 14, 15, Carmen McRae. Okay, I can tell you exactly how old I was. 1952, it came out. So it means that Edie Gourmet and Carmen did it in, within like, like 53. So I started singing this song when I heard Carmen do it. I thought it was one of the greatest songs. I pictured it in my head. The actress in me saw all this happening. I started singing it and have sung it literally every night. I loved Carmen McRae's version. It became the song that everybody wanted to hear in the small clubs in Ohio. It was the song that John Levy heard. It was the song that Capitol Records heard. It is the song that everybody has heard literally every night, all these years. I took it out, I guess, I did a special show and somebody put together this new act and it wasn't in there. And I was absolutely in shock because it didn't feel right. I was not comfortable without singing Guess Who I Saw Today. The audience always went away disappointed because it wasn't there. I'm never going to not sing it. It is fresh every night because some different man has done that someplace <laughs> to somebody. It is always fresh. The song remains valid because men will continue to be men. I don't want to talk about you guys too bad, but <laughs> Please come don't. on. I, you know. Please don't. Is it, in fact, though, your favorite song? Probably not. Mm -hmm. uh, there's probably... I don't think lyrics get any better than Guess Who I Saw Today. Um, but there are songs like uh, Over the Weekend and when, when a Woman Loves a Man that I will love but not sing all the time. I probably would have to say it's because of everything it's meant and the fact that the song remains valid and it is, it, it, it's easy to picture it because somebody, as I said before, is going to go through this at some point. It would be my favorite only because it works so well, and it's uh, it's me. It also how glad I am is one that uh, allows me to tell you how I feel.
Your, your latest album, which I believe, and I've seen a number of uh, uh, numbers put to this, but it's the 52nd album. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah, I'm 52. Right. Somewhere in there. Well, I was there for a while, 58 when the 50th one came out, 51, but right. 50 I'm older than the albums. Okay, 52, right. So aptly named The Lady with a Song. Mm -hmm. Dr. George Butler says Nancy Wilson is a singer of songs, a singer-singer, and a lady with a song. That's some high praise there. As far as you're concerned, quite appropriate. Is that yes. how you see yourself? When I think of the quality of the material I have been singing for 38 years, when I remember, guess who I saw today, how glad I am, greatest performance of my life. I've never been to me. Joe, uh, lady with a song, don't ask my neighbor, what, over the weekend, the right to love. When I think of the quality and the fact that it has lasted so long, yes, I am just that. Finally, we always ask uh, our guests to, to leave us with, with a credo, some words of wisdom uh, for folks, and, and perhaps how you've lived your life and how you'd like to at least uh, impart knowledge uh, uh -huh. to others, how perhaps they should live theirs and, and help them. What would that be? Well, I think that we owe ourselves honesty. I think that... Uh, my feelings about children. As parents, I think that we need to share some of our live, lives with our children. I think we need to communicate with our children more. I think we need to recognize that the 14-year-old child today faces far more negative, they're just bombarded with things that are negative. We need to accept that and recognize the fact that we can't expect our children to be us we can't expect them to have it i thought my life was far easier than my children's life i think we need to recognize that share our lives with others and with children um, i want my children and i want most of young people to understand that there is help you need to talk to your parents but you also need to deal with a higher being you need to pray you need to ask for help you need to recognize the fact that you cannot do it alone uh, it worries me sometimes that there are those of us out here in this world who think that we are responsible for everything, that we must do it all ourselves, that stress becomes so heavy that we lose sight of reality. I want us to our own selves be true and take it to a higher power. Indeed. Nancy Wilson, thanks very much for being with us. Thank you.